So now our last two events of today um, before the reception, a fireside chat and a keynote speech. And I'll say in advance that we're not going to have question and answer sessions after the next two events, but we do have a reception. So store all your questions and have a chat with the speakers uh, then. I remember we had a bit of a problem when we were discussing earlier um, in the planning of this meeting, calling any event in Hyderabad in June a fireside chat. Um, but we kept to it because it creates the impression of an informal conversation with very informed people about very important subjects. And, uh, and that's exactly what we've got. The fireside chat today is on agriculture and nutrition and health. And many of us in the academy are very much aware that in the development of agriculture for nutrition initiatives, the focus has been very heavily on crops, laterally on livestock, and not very much as yet on aquaculture. It's been relatively neglected despite all we know about its importance in low and middle income country settings and its nutritional benefits. So we want to champion aquaculture and are delighted to have found a very special way to do this. David Little, a leading aquaculture researcher from the University of Stirling in the UK, will lead a discussion with the distinguished leader in aquaculture research, Dr. Modadugu Gupta, a World Food Prize laureate and former Assistant Director General of World Fish. So I'm delighted to invite David and Modadugu up to the stage for their chat. Thank you very much, and uh, welcome to you, Modadugu, on this uh, special event for food systems here in your home city of Hyderabad. We're still waiting for the fireside, but we'll just carry on with the chat, I think. Um, Modugu, you started, I believe, your career in Kolkata. Um, and at that time, I think it was quite exciting. It would have been in the 60s, and aquaculture would hardly be recognized around the world. What was, your, what was it like then in Kolkata? When I started my aquaculture research, my family members and friends said, why the hell are you going to fisheries? What pr progress you have, prosperity you have there. You have many more venues there because at that time aquaculture was not considered as a science. But only in 1970s when the production from the seas and the rivers has gone down due to overexploitation, the need for aquaculture just like agriculture was felt. That's where I entered the scene in 1970s. The focus at that time in Mavarkas, most of the research work is done in the institutions. At that time, I'm talking about research institutions and try to take the technologies from the research institutions to the farming community. Quite often, there is a mismatch between the technologies developed in ideal conditions in the research institutions and the conditions that exist in the farming conditions, farmers' fields. So my focus in 1970 was to work with the farmer communities and develop technologies that will suit their needs, both the social, economic, and cultural aspects. And in fact, 1970s, that was an, in fact, did an exemplary work in that one. For example, till then, in the research institution, the production was 3.2 tons per hectare of fish per year. But working with the farmers, using their agriculture byproducts and waste, we could show the, a production up to 5.5 tons, nearly double of what was produced in the research institutions. Initially, some people didn't believe that one, but when shown practically in the farmer's pond, they believed it. And what we call as a blue revolution now, at that time was called aqua explosion, explosion within the aqua water. Right. So that, that, that was you doing pharma first, long before it became trendy, I think. And probably really way, way ahead of your time. And I think that, that experience took you to Southeast Asia after that time, am I correct? Yeah, from there I moved on to Southeast Asia, Laos, Indo-Chinese countries, Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam. Where, these are Mekong River countries, where Mekong River flows all these four countries. And the people were getting their fish supplies from the Mekong River. But with the construction of lots of dams and uh, embankments on the Mekong River, the fish migration has stopped and fish production from the natural rivers has gone down. So the UN community was looking at aquaculture to replace the losses from the natural systems. Right. That's where 
I started working in Thailand, Laos, and Vietnam, and developing aquaculture technologies, again, that suit to those particular regions. So in those days, you know, it was almost accepted that we would be losing that wild harvest of fish and just simply substituting farm fish. Yeah. But I think we've moved on a bit since then in that we realize they're really closely linked. And yeah. the sort of work that you did once you left Southeast Asia, came back to Bangladesh, yeah. really took that to its heart, didn't it? Yes, from there I moved on to Bangladesh. As you know, Bangladesh, nearly two-thirds of the country goes underwater for about five to six months during the monsoon time. There was a plenty of water, but there is a dearth of fish. And people in Bangladesh like to have fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. The need is much more. The resources were there, but the fish was not there. So again, as you know, Bangladesh is one of the least developed countries. Poverty is so high, hunger is so high, but resources were lying there, but not utilized. So again, we're looking at going to the farming community and understanding their needs and develop a technology that could be adopted and practiced by them. So one of my problem was, as a scientist, I know what are the technological needs are there, but working in the grassroots level, as you all have been working with the communities now, is not that easy because in a new country, I don't know the social, economic, and uh, other aspects of the communities. The fisheries department in that country, in, I'm talking about the 1980s, has not developed, but there is a very good non-governmental organizations there who have been working with, uh, at grassroots level, so they understand the needs and constraints of the farming community. So we joined it together and started developing technologies that could suit. One example, I can give an example. In 1986, when I went to that country, there were more nearly a million backyard ponds or ditches because it's a low-lying area of Bangladesh. People dig the soil, make an elevated platform and construct a house on that. With the result, you know, behind the house, there is a small ditch or a pond, which is used for multi-purpose. So these, some of them are uh, seasonal, retaining water four to six months, and some are perennial. And we were looking at, when I went there in, into that country, they were all lying fallow because they could not find a fish species or a system that could be practiced in those conditions. So we looked at new varieties of fish, which could reach the market size in four to six months' time. And we could show the farming community, within four to six months' time, we can, they can produce two tons per hectare, mostly using the kitchen waste. No external inputs are in there. So, so new innovations that you brought in, but you didn't come in with a sort of set idea, with a, a pre-prepared technology. And at that time, I think that was, that was quite normal. We raised fish in this way in square ponds, and we have feed that we feed the fish. You actually went in and looked and said, well, what have farmers got? Hey, they've got ditches, they've got water in, they've got fish in. Why don't we work with them? And I think at the time, that was really quite unusual. And in fact, we quite often learned lots of things from the farming community. We as scientists know, think that we know everything, but those farmers they have been working for ages together, the problems and all that. So when we went into the field and started working with them, our understanding was that they grow the fish in their backyard pond and will consume and improve their nutrition. But at the end of six months, we found out 80% of the fish they were producing, they were selling in the market. The reason was, there is a high value species they were growing in that one. They cannot afford to consume that high value species. So they were selling what they were producing in the market and buying cheap marine dry fish. In fact, which is more nutritious because the whole fish is eaten. So that's the way an understanding working with the communities, we can learn a lot of things, you know. So, that one. so really, food systems up front, we've heard this before, farmers selling and actually engaging in a strategy to meet their nutritional needs. In fact, indirectly their nutrition has improved because they're buying this cheap fish market and consuming it, their nutrition has improved. And also lots of benefit has taken place which we are not envisaged when we started the program. Subsequently, what we thought is that if we could involve the women in that country, women at that time in 1980s were not going out to the field and working. They were, for various religious restrictions or whatever it is, they were mostly restricted to the whole. 
the family sizes are very, very big with four to six children, husband, man, and one man were, uh, earning the, making a earning that's not good for the family, and the nutritional status was very poor. We thought if we could engage the woman in this small-scale aquaculture, which is not very highly technical, then we started allying, along, al again, in cooperation with the non-governmental organization. It was not easy. First, we have to form the groups, motivate them, train them, and get the needed uh, loans, credit, from the non-governmental organizations and monitor them. And in fact, within two to three years' time, though we started with a few villages, it spread like a wildfire to all the, the entire country. The benefits were many more. The income of the household has increased. The nutrition of the household has increased. And another thing that what we have not envisaged initially was it has empowered the woman. Till then, the ma man was the master in the households, in poor families, in that communities. The man is served the food. Then after the food is served to the children, and the last comes to the woman if at all anything is left. In many households, we have seen that just the rice and salt that they were eating. There was nothing money, more money. But when the woman started earning additional money along with her husband, she had a voice in the family. She can dictate. Before that, the children were being sent as laborers to the agriculture fields and all that. But once the woman became an earning member, she started sending the children to the school. So there was an empowerment, actually, that has led to that mm. with, the, with the earning power that women have been involved in these household activities. So, so really, you heard it here first, fish as a force for social change came to Bangladesh. And I'm sure there will be other memories such as that from from people who've worked in that area. Certainly for myself, I've seen massive changes in Bangladesh. Yeah. From a point where in the mid-80s, really everyone ate wild fish, and now more than 50% of that country's, uh, country's catch, as it were, comes, comes from aquaculture. But looking forward a little bit, <clears throat> you were uh, Assistant Deputy Director of uh, the World Fish Organization, the CGIR organization yeah. responsible for fish. And at that time, they were developing new, improved strains of a tropical fish, tilapia, that I think you were very instrumental in introducing and popularizing in Bangladesh and indeed throughout, throughout the world. So if you look at the production increases in the crops, it is because of genetic improvement that has taken place, whether it's wheat or it is rice or any other thing. But if you come to the fish, you know, nearly 91% nearly of aquaculture production in the world comes from Asia. And there was not a single species of fish which has been improved. In fact, it's been proved actually due to continuous inbreeding, what we call it, using the same parents generation after generation, there is a depression in and the growth has to decline. So we were looking at the World Fish Center, how could we improve the <coughs> production of the fish? And we have taken tilapia as a test species. In fact, when we started working with the tilapia, some people commented, this is a poor man fish, an international organization, why is it working with a useless fish? But we said CGIR and the world fish is meant for the poor people. See, this is a hardy fish, can reach to table size within three to four months without much additional input. So that is the reason that was selected. Now you see after three decades, it is the second largest international traded fish species in the world. So that has made a lot of changes in the world. So the research was done in the Philippines, but again, once the strain has been developed, that has been distributed to different countries in Asia, and now subsequently also into Africa. And each of the countries have developed their own program so that this fish can adapt themselves to the conditions prevailing in the, those particular countries. Mm. So, but we still see tilapia actually fulfilling a whole range of roles, I think, nutritionally, yeah. and, and partly because it's an animal that freely breeds. Once it's established in rural communities, it doesn't need constant <coughs> uh, replacement with, with new seed. Yeah. And yeah. that's been one of the highlights, I think, because when you've looked at how these fish get established in supporting livelihoods, supporting nutrition, having that easy availability of the juveniles yeah. is right. really important. Right. In fact, if you go, if this farmers grow the tilapia in their pond, 
they can take two or three fish every day for their kitchen, you see. So that is an easy to grow fish and it doesn't require any expensive inputs for feeding or fertilizing the waters or anything like that. So it's a very hardy fish because now the fish are being affected by the diseases, just like in the crop sector. But compared to other types of fish, tilapia is a very hardy fish and not <coughs> that much susceptible to diseases. But I think we all agree it's not a silver bullet. And as we look around the world of rural Africa and Asia, people generally rely on a whole range of different aquatic animals. And I think that's really desirable because yeah. they all bring something different to the diet. It's not like comparing fish with chicken. There's many types of fish and other aquatic animals that bring different micronutrients to the table. But I think another issue that's often critiqued in terms of aquaculture is it's a rich man's game. And again, I think your experience in Bangladesh where you looked at how poorer people could access aquatic resources through leasing was a really interesting uh, d development, really, and it's been mirrored around the world now. But I actually, I look at the fish as a poor man's diet. Because if you look at the communities living alongside the rivers or in the ponds and all that, they catch the fish. Now, if you look at the statistics, actually, aquaculture statistics is not that reliable because there is no way of collecting the statistics for aquaculture production. So actually, when you compare to the beef or pork or chicken, in most of the communities, price of chicken is much less. And also, we, as your research has done, Dave, Dave that has shown that is high in omega fatty acids. For example, a small fish like called as mola in, available in Bangladesh and now introduced in many other countries, it's about two inches long. That is very high in vitamin A. For example, in case of Bangladesh, a study has indicated if all the ponds that are present in Bangladesh produce just 10 kilograms per year of this fish, you don't need any supplementary vitamin A that is being distributed at that time from by the USAID. Likewise, there is a fish in Vietnam called the Mekong Flying Bar. It is very high in iron content. So in areas where there is enemic, the fish is being served during the midday meals in the high schools. So there are fish, you know, the fish is much better in nutrition perspective as compared to some of the beef or pork or poultry. And I think we all agree, I mean, I think most nutritionists agree that the high bioavailability is really an important benefit yeah. in fish. Yeah. Well, I think we better wrap up. Um, great talking to you again after meeting, I think, in, oh, when was it, 1981 or something like that <laughs> in a rice field in northeast Thailand. Um, I owe you a debt because you were, to me, someone who were out there really working and learning from farmers for their benefit. And I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you.